This is a presentation about the definition, diagnosis, and classification of diabetes, prediabetes, and metabolic syndrome from the 2018 Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines. My name is Zubin Panthaki. I'm an endocrinologist from McMaster University in Hamilton, and the co-authors on this chapter were Dr. Ronald Goldenberg and Dr. Pamela Katz. There are no changes to the recommendations in this chapter. In particular, there are no changes to the diagnostic criteria for diabetes, prediabetes, or metabolic syndrome. However, the text does include new information to differentiate between type 1, type 2, and monogenic diabetes in clinical practice. There are many types and causes of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which includes latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, is a pancreatic beta cell destruction that usually leads to absolute insulin deficiency. The cause is most often immune-mediated, but there are idiopathic forms as well. Type 2 diabetes, which is the most common cause of diabetes, ranges from, pre from predominantly insulin resistance with relative insulin deficiency to significant insulin deficiency in the setting of insulin resistance. Gestational diabetes is glucose intolerance that onsets or has first recognition during pregnancy and may or may not persist after pregnancy is complete. There are many other types of diabetes, including genetic forms, forms of diabetes that are related to other diseases such as acromegaly and thyroid disease, and diabetes associated with multiple uh, medications and drugs, which include L-asparaginase, antipsychotics, and others, which are detailed in the Diabetes Guidelines document. The chapter includes information to help distinguish between type 1, type 2, and monogenic diabetes. These are sometimes difficult to distinguish in clinical practice, but this distinction may be important as the treatment for the different conditions may vary. Age of onset in type 1 diabetes and monogenic diabetes is usually less than 25 years, but it can occur older. Type 2 diabetes is often diagnosed in older people, but because of the increase in prevalence of obesity, it is more commonly being identified in adolescents and young adults. Obesity is very common in people with type 2 diabetes, but weight can vary uh, similar to the general population in those with type 1 and monogenic diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, usually being autoimmune, does often have the presence of antibodies to the islets, and C-peptide levels are often very low or undetectable, whereas in type 2 diabetes, they may be high, particularly after the initial glucotoxic phase. First-line treatment for type 1 diabetes is insulin. For type 2 diabetes, initially, unless there is metabolic decompensation, non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents often will be adequate. But with time, most people with type 2 diabetes may also need insulin. Monogenic diabetes can be quite varied, and some people respond to sulfonylureas, others to insulin, others to diet. The hereditary nature of diabetes is important, as people with type 2 diabetes have a 75 to 90 percent heritability. Monogenic diabetes is autosomal dominant, so 50% may transmit the condition. And type 1 diabetes has infrequent family history of others with type 1 diabetes. Importantly, type 1 diabetes may often present with diabetic ketoacidosis, whereas this is less common with type 2 diabetes and monogenic diabetes. The diagnostic criteria for diabetes are value above the following thresholds. Fasting plasma glucose of 7.0 millimoles per liter or more, hemoglobin A1c of 6.5% or more, or a two-hour plasma glucose in a 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test, or a random plasma glucose of 11.1 millimoles per liter or more. These thresholds were determined based on levels at which the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy significantly rises for each of the tests in different populations. The hemoglobin A1c criterion of 6.5% or more has been established more recently since the assay for hemoglobin A1c has been standardized across the world. 
Before committing an asymptomatic patient to a diagnosis of diabetes lifelong, it is important to confirm the diagnosis with repeat blood testing, generally with the same test that was used initially, fasting glucose A1C or a two-hour plasma glucose after 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. The test should be done in a timely fashion on a separate day. However, if a random glucose level was the initial test that uh, suggested a diagnosis of diabetes, confirmation should be done with one of the other tests. If the results of two different tests are available at the same time, and both are above the diagnostic thresholds for diabetes, then diabetes diagnoses are confirmed and repeat testing is not necessary. There are situations where confirmatory testing is not required before making a diagnosis and starting treatment. The first is in the case of a symptomatic patient with hyperglycemia with things such as weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia. The second situation would be in a patient in whom you suspect type 1 diabetes and delaying treatment to make a confirmatory diagnosis would potentially lead to dangerous consequences. Hemoglobin A1c is a test that requires a little bit of extra thinking before using it to make a diagnosis of diabetes. It needs to be done using a validated standardized assay. Repeat confirmatory testing can be done on a separate day with the same test. We need to recognize that there are certain conditions that lead to a misleading hemoglobin A1c result and A1c has not been adequately validated for diagnosis of diabetes in children and adolescents as the sole test in pregnant women or in those with cystic fibrosis or suspected type 1 diabetes. It's been demonstrated that ethnicity and age can affect hemoglobin A1c results and the relationship between A1c and diabetes complications, but we do not yet have sufficient evidence to propose different cutoffs for these different groups. Hemoglobin A1c is used as a diagnostic test for diabetes because it strongly correlates with glucose levels. However, there are some health conditions and medications which can significantly alter that correlation and make hemoglobin A1c an invalid test for diabetes. These include conditions that affect rates of erythropoiesis, alter hemoglobin molecule, alter the glycation of hemoglobin, increase the rates of erythrocyte destruction, or directly interfere with the assay for glycated hemoglobin. The reasons to choose one test over another for making a diagnosis of diabetes may include the established history of that test as a standard for diagnosing diabetes, convenience and palatability for the patient, cost of the test, and other comorbidities or considerations that may make one of the tests less reliable. Patients will often have several glycemic tests done at the same time. In the majority of cases, these tests will demonstrate agreement about the diagnosis of diabetes or not. However, if the results are discordant, then the test whose result is above the diagnostic cut point should be repeated and the diagnosis made on the basis of the repeat test. The term prediabetes is a convenient term that denotes intermediate glycemic levels between normal glucose metabolism and diabetes. These include impaired fasting glucose with a fasting value between 6.1 and 6.9 millimoles per liter, impaired glucose tolerance with a post two hour oral glucose tolerance test value of 7.8 to 11.0 millimoles per liter, and a hemoglobin A1c between 6.0 and 6.4%. Prediabetes is a relevant condition because it both predicts development of diabetes over time and is an important cardiovascular risk factor. In particular, we can see that there are increased levels of risk of developing diabetes over five years as the hemoglobin A1c goes up between the normal range and the diabetes range Diabetes Canada chose to call 6.0 to 6.5% prediabetes because it significantly increases the risk of having diabetes over the next five years. Metabolic syndrome is a clustering of metabolic abnormalities that are related to insulin resistance and lead to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. These include central adiposity, defined differently for men and women of different ethnicities, 
elevated triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol, elevated blood pressure that represents endothelial dysfunction, and an elevated fasting plasma glucose denote, denoting dysglycemia. The following slides reiterate the diagnostic criteria for diabetes and prediabetes as recommendations with their grade of recommendation and the level of evidence supporting those recommendations. Diabetes diagnosis can be made on the basis of fasting plasma glucose, hemoglobin A1c in when it's appropriate, and a two hour plasma glucose in the setting of a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test or with a random plasma glucose. In patients with symptoms of hyperglycemia, a single test is adequate to make a diagnosis of diabetes, but in the absence of symptoms, a second test should be done to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. It's preferable to repeat the same test on a separate day for confirmation, but if a random glucose was the initial test done, then one of the others should be used for confirmation. If two different test results are available on the same day and both suggest diabetes, then separate testing is not required for confirmation. Finally, to avoid rapid metabolic deterioration in people with suspected type 1 diabetes, treatment for diabetes should not be delayed in order to obtain confirmatory testing. For prediabetes, the criteria for diagnosis of impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, and prediabetes on the basis of hemoglobin A1c are described. Key messages for this chapter are that diabetes, as it is defined, is associated with diabetic retinopathy and is also related to long-term complications including other microvascular and macrovascular disease complications based on the diagnostic thresholds described earlier. The term prediabetes relates to impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, and elevated hemoglobin A1c, which puts individuals at increased risk for developing diabetes and cardiovascular. People with diabetes or at risk for diabetes should be aware that there are two main types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, as well as other forms including gestational diabetes, which occurs during pregnancy, and monogenic diabetes, which occasionally can be difficult to distinguish from the first two types described. Furthermore, prediabetes refers to blood glucose levels that are intermediate between normal and diabetes ranges. Although some people with prediabetes will develop type 2 diabetes, many will not. Patients with diabetes should di discuss the type of diabetes with their healthcare provider. And those who are at risk should know that there are several types of blood tests that can be done to determine if a person has diabetes, and a confirmatory test should be done in most situations. This presentation and more information about diabetes diagnosis and classification can be found on the website for Diabetes Canada and with their mobile apps.